So hello everybody, I'm Eva. And even though this is a Python conference, I will not be talking to you so much about Python itself, but I would like to tell you more like a story behind the research I'm working on, and it deals with knotted proteins. So proteins, those tiny things that are in all our bodies, the key players that makes our bodies work. If I give you an example of hemoglobin, that's something you all probably know, that's a protein that goes from our lungs to all other parts of our body and carries the oxygen, so it helps us breathe. You know that proteins are quite important to us, and it's honestly pretty fascinating to study them. So let's have a look at how protein looks like. When a protein is being created, it looks like a long string of tiny beads, where the beads, the building blocks of the proteins, it's called amino acids, and we have 20 different types of them. You can imagine it as like 20 different colors of the beads. And from these beads, you're making the whole protein. As long as the protein's finished, it does not stay in this like linear form, but it immediately falls into some 3D structure. And in its 3D structure, it stays for its whole life. And the 3D structure is like crucial for the protein because it determines the function of the protein. So if you look at the structures here, for example, at the orange one, it looks maybe a bit like a U-shape, like a pocket. So its function might be that some other molecule comes and sticks to the pocket. Or the blue thing there, it's like a tunnel. So it sits somewhere in a cell membrane and it guards which things can slip through in and out of the cell. Let's have a look at the folding itself. When you have this protein sequence somewhere naturally, maybe in a cell, it can fold into the 3D structure like immediately in milliseconds. But when you're a scientist and you have this amino acid sequence, which is quite easy to get with experiments, how long do you think it will take you to get the 3D structure? And we can do like warm-up activity where you can do a measurement with your hand. It will be like hours, maybe days, months. You can show it. If you have any guess. Yeah, great. Most of you is right. It's maybe somewhere there. <laughs> because if you know what you're doing, if you have some protein you've maybe worked with already, it may take you months, but usually it's more like years. And there's a joke. It's a pretty bad joke because it says that every protein in a database took a PhD life. So it's not that great, right? This difficulty in obtaining the three structures of proteins is very nicely demonstrated in the size of protein databases we have. So if you have a look at the UNIREF database, which is the database of all protein sequences, it is something like 300 million of sequences. If you want to work with that, you have to cluster the database, so you end up with something like 50 million of sequences. But if you have to we want to have a look at the 3D structures, and that's like the important thing because you want to know the function of the protein. You're at something like 190 hundreds, th thousands records. So it's not that much, right? And this disproportion between getting the protein structure and protein sequence is really nice demonstrated in the size of databases. And this plot shows that it will definitely not get better in the future years. So maybe it would be really good for us if we can have some predictions tools that will help us to get the three structure of the protein. We can plug in the protein sequence and it will predict for us the three structure. Luckily, you have something like that. And there's a really nice competition about this. It's called CASP and it runs every two years. And the guys from the competition publish some protein sequences with unknown structure. And basically anybody can join this competition with their models and they try to predict the structure of these protein sequences. And then the organizers come, they get the real structure and they see who's doing the prediction the best. In the past years, the leaderboard looked something like that. On the x-axis we have all the models that join this competition and on the y-axis we have like how well they do in the prediction. And then your 2020 came, and there was one tool that like completely rolled over all the other tools. 
it was all cut. It was called AlphaFold. And the best thing about this is that this tool was so good that its precision was almost at the level of what we are able to achieve with our experiments, with those costly experiments which were running for years. So that's a great thing to have. And let's now have a look inside at how AlphaFold looks. Not surprisingly, it's a machine learning thing that is trained on all available 3D protein structures. And there's a pretty nice schema, which we can split into like three parts. The first part deals with encoding the structures, the protein sequences. So I actually didn't tell one thing, which is pretty important and interesting about proteins. And that is, if you have two protein sequences that are kind of similar, it's very probable that their three structure will look very similar. So on this example, we have hemoglobin protein sequence from human, mouse, and fish. And if you have a look at the human sequence and the fish sequence, maybe only like half of the sequence is the same. But the three structure looks almost the same. And it's because the function is the same. So if you go back to the schema, that's exactly what's happening in the first part. You have your protein sequence in the input. And what you're doing is that you're looking through a database of protein sequences and trying to find something that would be similar to your input sequence. And what you hope for is that you can maybe extract from there some patterns and get something that might be useful for modeling the 3D structure. Then the input is like a matrix of all pairs of amino acids in the sequence and their potential contacts. And then a logical thing, you're looking for some already existing 3D structure that would help you to model your input protein. Then the second part is like in the processing of this input information. Maybe you spotted there the word evolformer. It sounds a bit like a transformer. And that's almost what's inside there. And the third part is like the modeling itself. So what you're outputting is like X, Y, Z coordinates of each amino acid in the input protein. Now, if you would like to predict your bright new protein's 3D structure, it's honestly not so easy because this whole thing is really big, it's computationally demanding, and one structure may take several hours to compute. So people started thinking, can we do it somehow faster maybe? Like it's great, we have this thing that can predict a 3D structure in one hour, but you know, we are doing these experiments for years, but still, it might be something that will do that better. And the idea is that we spot what is the slowest part, and that was like this database search for some similar proteins. What we can do here is that we replace this slow part with some language model, maybe, that would capture the idea of the whole protein universe, and it would maybe understand the proteins the same way as the database can, and it would much faster, right? So here comes ESM fault, which did exactly this thing. It took basically the same scheme as AlphaFold had, but they replaced the slow part with their own language model trained on proteins, and now we can do the prediction in seconds, so that's great. This is a bit longer interaction about proteins, how they work, the three structures. And now let's shift a bit and let's talk about large language models. So what is that? What is large language model? In a simple word, it's type of an AI that is somehow able to understand and generate text. Usually these models are trained on a huge data sets, for example, all articles from Wikipedia or something like that. And they try it in a very specific manner. Uh, on the input, you're giving them a sentence. For example, here we have, there was a king who had 12 beautiful daughters. And in the sentence, you hide one word. So this daughter's word will be masked. And what you want from your model is to predict you the probability distribution of this hidden word. So what this model does is that it predicts a couple of words with some probabilities where the word daughter scores with the highest probability, so that's exactly what you want. And what you hope for is that this model can capture somehow the idea of the text of the language. 
However, training these types of models is extremely demanding because you have to have a huge data set, model itself is really big, so usually only big companies can afford this. But when you have this model trained, it's really good and you can use it for some subsequent tasks. So for example, like classical thing, when you have movie reviews and you're classifying them into positive and negative, what you can do is that you can take some of the already trained models, you basically cut the last layer which was predicting the next word and you replace it with a layer that will be predicting positive and negative and you only fine tune this model on your specific task. And what you hope for is that the model already understands the text so it's easy to just slightly adjust it and it will output you whatever you want. Nowadays, this fine tuning has become really easy because we have, for example, hugging face. So for those of you who don't know that, it's like a little advertisement, it's a really cool thing. It's a, let's say, platform for data science and machine learning where you can easily share your models and data sets. And fine tuning has become this simple. It's like whole code for fine tuning the model in the first lines, you just download the model that is already available through Hugging Face, you just load your data set, you train it, and that's it. Now, you might wonder, how is this nature language related to proteins? It's a bit different, right? <coughs> Not really, because you can imagine that the protein is somehow a language. It's pretty easy because each amino acid has its letter code, so you can imagine that each amino acid, each building block of the protein, is a word, and you can then do with the protein the same thing as in normal language. You can mask some amino acids, and you can train a model that will be predicting which amino acid is missing. People have already tried it, so we have, for example, Protbert model that is trained on like a whole database of protein sequences. If you spotted the word bird inside this name, yes, it relates to the bird architecture in like normal language. It's the same thing, but just trained on proteins. And another example is ESM model, which is something I already mentioned when we are predicting the tree structure. It's like the faster tool. So when we have these models available through Hugging Face, it has become really easy basically for anybody to play with proteins. So even you can try that pretty easily. And finally, we're getting to something I'm playing with, and that's proteins with knots. I know it sounds a bit weird, but it's a pretty fascinating thing, and it's built on a whole field, mathematical field, that's from something like 18th century, it's a knot theory, and it's a theory uh, categorizing different types of knots and trying to distinguish them from each other. So on this picture we have like different examples of the knots, from the simplest one, which is like a knot to three one knot, which is something you probably tie on your shoelaces or somewhere, and then many others. And maybe here to just explain the terminology, the first number here refers to the number of crossings in the knot, and the second number is there just to distinguish different types of knots with the same number of crossings. How does this work with proteins? It's basically the same thing, but proteins are a bit more complicated, so you maybe don't see at the first look if the protein is knotted or not. But most of the proteins are unknotted, meaning if you pull the protein from both ends, it will untie. But there exist some knotted proteins. Most of them have this most simple 3-1 knot, but there exist some other guys like 6-1 knot or maybe uh, even double 3-1 knot in bacteria. Even though knotted proteins were studied for quite some time, we are still not 100% sure what's the purpose of the knot. So there are some ideas, maybe uh, the knot tries to prevent the protein from degradation, or, for example, we know that the knot creates in some proteins the active side of the protein. This is like responsible for the function of a protein. So it's like the very important part of the protein. But what we really love to know, but we still don't, is if there exists any amino acid pattern that would be like responsible for the knotting. And that's the place when we came up with our research. And our idea is that we take protein sequences and we build a model on them, which will try to categorize them if the protein is unknotted or knotted. 
and then we would try to interpret somehow the model and see if we can extract from it some patterns of the knotting. When you want to train machine learning thing, you need some data set for it, right? So one would say you're very lucky, you have this alpha fold tool that will predict to you many, many protein structures, so you can just look through this database and see if we have some knotted structures, take them, take some unknotted, build a data set from that, easy task. Okay, it's not that easy, because if you do it with this simple approach, you will end up with a data set that is completely biased and the model would learn like absolutely nothing about the nothing, so you have to be a bit smarter. It's in every machine learning project, the data set building to us like 80% of the time, and when you already think you're finished, it's like somebody coming, well, we maybe forgot about this thing, so we have to rebuild the database, and you have a very beginning, so after like half a year, we finally got something, and we ended up with building it almost manually, the database, because uh, we wanted to be really sure that the proteins we have there are really knotted, so we manually uh, manually treated these proteins and took only protein families that we were sure with, for which existed some already uh, experiment determined to restructure that was not it. With this approach, we got quite a nice data set, which was, uh, had something like 200,000 proteins. It was nicely balanced, so it was really good for us. And I already mentioned that we are now available these protein models. So we try to use one of them, ProtBird, and fine tune it on this data set. And before we actually started the fine tuning, we we're curious how much does the model already know about the nothing? It's already shown that these models have some understanding of the protein pictures. So for example, if you get protein embeddings, it's like the inner representation of the model about the protein, the model already knows for example, from which kingdom the protein comes, or for example, which structure it possesses. So we tried it for our knotting problem, and we saw that the model already has some understanding of the knotting, even before it was trained. So it was a good thing for us. We then took our data set, we tried to train the model, and we got pretty nice results with the overall accuracy around 98%. It was actually a bit suspicious. We were worried, for example, that the model might learn only to recognize the biggest protein family, so we already also checked this thing, but it looked completely fine, so we then approached to the interpretation part. When we tried to see what the model thinks that might be responsible for the noting, like which patterns in the sequence. We tried a couple of things but the best working was our custom technique when we were like patching parts of the sequences and for each patch we saw how the model prediction would drop. So basically if you cover part of the protein sequence, how much does the noting score drop? And with this approach you can get the place where the drop is biggest and with this patch you can basically break the knot. So you can then aggregate all those patches and see if you can extract some biological meaning from them. Uh, we tried it for one particular protein family where we observed that the model primarily focuses at the end of the knot core and we're also able to get some pattern in there, which was pretty interesting. And we observed that this uh, pattern is closely related with the function of the protein. But we would like to continue with this. We tried the interpretation only with one family, so it would be good to extend it to some other families. And what's a bit like a crazy idea, but what might work someday, is that we would like to create our own protein with not like completely artificial de designed thing. You might still ask, is this somehow useful? And honestly, this is a bit tricky question for us, but I'll try to give you some examples. Uh, for example, there's a research that says that improper formation of a knot might be somehow related to your obesity. 
And another thing, we know that some knotted protein families, for example, spouse family, uh, is very important in our body and that the knot is really tightly related to its function. And one of the function can be related to bacterial resistance, so maybe deeper understanding of the knotting would help us to develop some new targets for antibacterial drugs. And to conclude this talk, uh, just remember proteins are cool, especially knotted proteins are cool, and research on proteins is something we really need. As a last thing, I would like to thank to my team who helped me with this project, and also thank to you for listening. So if I understand you, at this moment, just distinguish if it's knotted or unknotted and nothing more, like you don't try to, to distinguish the knots, like what Different kind of... types of knots, not yeah. yet, but we might want to try that in the future. And basically all your samples, if I understand, are completely, uh, like most of the samples you were trying are at this moment artificially made. Like most of the knotted proteins are not artificially present in predicted. the... Yeah. yeah. And are you able to, to see, like, maybe... Okay, we can Sorry. discuss later, it's fine. <laughs> Um, how much is the research considering modeling of proteins limited with post-translational modifications, since I guess it's hard to predict them, and this influences the structure and the catalytic, catalytic activity as well? Do you know how far you can get without considering this, or are there already options to consider this? Like, no idea about post-translational modification at this stage. Okay. Are there plans for the future? From my side, probably not, because I'm not like a lab person, okay. but maybe somebody else has this idea. Okay. Well, it's just a matter of interest. <laughs> That's what's very really interesting. Yeah. Presentation. Thanks for your talk. Um, you were talking about a solution based on, on BERT, um, uh, part of library. Uh, have you tried any, any other deep learning based solution? And which yeah. solution? Uh, you we tried other transform based things like this ESM. It worked very similarly, so we just stick to this one. And we also tried to use simple convolution neural network. It honestly worked pretty well a bit worse, but still real well, so it looks like this knotting problem is somehow quite simple to distinguish. And what we also tried to do is to take just the embeddings from the bird and then try train some small thing on top of that. It also worked pretty well, but we just stick to this thing. Really good talk. Um, I was interested in the LMM stuff. So you said you would train it on a protein data set afterwards. Have you tried just dropping in, say, a GPT-3 and seeing if it can discern the different proteins just as is? Uh, we were thinking about it. I think guys would try something like that. But yeah, connect to those guys over yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, very, very nice talk and uh, very interesting research. The uh, question is regarding the knot proteins and the problem of finding which protein is knotted and not knotted. Uh, how did you, how tec which technique did you use to, to distinguish between these two, two sets? Uh, there's a Python package, it's called Topoly. Uh, it's done by guys from Poland. They're doing these regions for quite some time, so they already know how these things work. and what you do is that you take your 3D structure and you run this tool on that and it will output to you which type of node you have there. Okay, uh, but you base on the, on the protein sequence and then you move to the 3D representation by some kind of uh, molecular dynamics modeling or? 
how did you get the 3D, uh, 3D presentation of the protein? By AlphaFold. Ah, by AlphaFold. It's okay. predicted. Okay. okay, thanks. We do not have any questions on the Discord. Uh, if we have any questions in here, we still have time. Oops, sorry. Any more? No? Then thank you, Eva, for your great talk and nice work. <laughs>